All right. Good afternoon or late morning, everyone. Uh, Rich with TMC and want to thank you for taking some time out of your definitely busy days uh, to join us uh, once again for the last week in mortgage today. Uh, 30 minute whirlwind tour through all things mortgage industry uh, that we've been doing now for a couple months uh, each week at 2 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday. Uh, every week I enlist uh, uh, the services of one of our members that uh, is, is smarter than me <laughs> and uh, to talk about what's going on in the industry. And I am thrilled this week to have the CEO of Bank South Mortgage, Kim Nelson, joining me. Kim, thanks for doing this with me this week. Thank you. Excited to be here. And you're in the office, it looks like, right? I am. That, uh, not, that's unusual, actually, for me these days. I have two small kids, so I've been doing the back and forth between the office and home a lot. I, I know I've talked to some of our members with small kids. They're, they're trying to get to the office and out of the house and leaving their significant other with the kids. So, Yeah, there are those days. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. I really appreciate you taking the time out. Um, Bank South, uh, can you tell the viewers a little bit about Bank South um, for those that don't know? Sure. We are located in Atlanta, Georgia, and primarily serve the state of Georgia. However, we are um, a wholly owned subsidiary of Bank South, a community bank that holds a national charter. So we can lend in other states. Our lending policy uh, permits us to lend um, in the Southeast without, you know, having to go through too many approvals. And we will lend some one-offs in other states, but primarily Georgia, all retail focus. Uh, this year will close pretty close to $2 billion. In, in a normal origination year, we are, you know, a billion to 75-ish. Um, we have about 52 loan officers and um, a lot of high-performing teams we are very much about technology and customer experience and we are an LMA Encompass user, if that's helpful for anyone on the call. I think we got a few members that are on Encompass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for the background and uh, let's go ahead and get started. like to start this show off each week, just a look around the news headlines of the last week. There were several uh, in the last week, um, pretty much all of them, like booming uh, housing numbers, releases, indicators. Uh, start with new home sales uh, was released late last week, a 14-year high, uh, the highest totals we've seen since 2006 for new home sales. Um, and you guys, uh, construction business at Bank South. We do construction lending. It's, uh, you know, we're, our bank is a pretty small from, from an asset size perspective. They're about 900 million. So we're limited on how much of that we can do, but we do some of that. And um, we, we do enjoy the, one of the top five lenders for new construction on the uh, retail side for mortgage in the state of Georgia. So we do a lot of new construction. Awesome. New home sales are going crazy. And, you know, you could look at it two ways. Um, you, you could say, hey, this is a byproduct of the essentially delayed spring buying season that's all been compressed into the summer and the early fall months. Um, you know, a lot of people believe that just the whole pandemic thing has um, really changed the way people view their homes. Uh, some flock to the suburbs, bigger houses, home offices. What are you seeing in the Atlanta, Georgia area? Well, we actually um, started to see a huge increase year over year starting in January. So really before the pandemic, um, it was, you know, already starting to happen. So we, you know, we think there was a lot of pent up demand, you know, from that millennial and um, Gen Y, Gen Z group that, uh, you know, maybe we're sitting on the sidelines and, you know, have, have started to, uh, enter and be a part of the demand for housing today. So I, I don't think it's all pa pandemic related, but uh, there's definitely some of that. It caused, you know, people to sort of rethink, you know, their, how their house feels with, you know, everybody at home all the time and kids learning and different things. So 
you know, we are seeing a lot of people um, move to the suburbs from, you know, some of the higher uh, density, you know, uh, areas and higher taxes and that type of thing. So we, we have seen a lot of that, but it's not, it's not a, you know, like a mass exodus or anything. There's as many people moving in as there are moving out. And, um, but, you know, some who have figured out that they can work remotely and work from home or are finding, you know, larger acreage, you know, that type of thing and, and moving to water communities and, and such. Yep. Um, and want to stop and remind everybody, all everybody in attendance, uh, interactive, any thoughts, questions, comments, please don't hesitate, uh, drop them in the chat or the Q and A uh, comments, anything we're talking about, anything you'd like to hear us talk about, uh, please, uh, we, uh, encourage interaction. So, well, yeah, I know. And I think you're spot on. I mean, I, I think there was pent up demand, you know, coming into the spring this year. And then we kind of had the pause was everybody was trying to figure out what the hell was going on. And, uh, and now you're seeing, you know, I think, you know, some of the results of that pause, plus some of that pent up demand before. And I think just the val people value their home more now. And you couldn't tell by the size of my kitchen in the background. I'm ready for a new house myself. And my timing is horrible right now because uh, uh, prices are through the roof and uh, uh, not maybe the best time to buy a house, but it's still happening like crazy. And builders, like they can't build homes quick enough. Builder confidence. Um, one of the things we talked about in last, last week's show is also at, at nearly a 20 year high. Uh, any relationships you have with builders? I'm, I'm sure that's what you're hearing from them uh, in your market as well, right? Right. We're absolutely hearing that. And the problem that they're facing is with the local municipalities. They're really um, putting a lot of restrictions, driving, you know, home prices up and really making it less affordable for uh, people to buy. And so they're, they're struggling, you know, let's just say, for example, if a, a local municipality says they will only allow three sides brick or um, they want sidewalks throughout the entire community and or they won't allow, um, you know, an in tandem garage, you know, basically a single garage townhome. And so they're starting to see some of those restrictions and lumber costs are up um, tremendously for them. They're seeing um, about a $16,000 cost per home, you know, increase just due to lumber costs. And so, you know, between the local municipalities, um, banks not doing acquisition and development lending like they used to and need to do again to help solve the inventory problems. And then, you know, just the local municipalities driving the home prices, um, home expense up for new home builders is making it difficult. And then, you know, there's still a lot of lender restrictions out there as to how many specs a builder can have on the ground at one time, you know, because of the um, the melt, you know, the meltdown of 2000, you know, six, seven, and eight, uh, and beyond. I guess, you know, there's there's still some restrictions there that are, you know, causing us to not gain any traction on the inventory shortage problems. And then just yeah. for people who are moving out of larger square footage homes, you know, to 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 replace what they have in square footage is for the same or similar monies is is difficult because you know the, the cost of build has gone up so much if there's a greater than 20 percent disparity between the two that's crazy and it's been such a good year for mortgage lending and the mortgage industry yet you know there are some looming issues that could really you know, create some problems in the years to come one is affordability mm -hmm. um and you know i think redfin came out with the report on this past friday uh, that said that home sale prices were up 14% year over year. That's crazy to me. Um, and, but I think a lot of that is the byproduct of what you were talking about. Uh, it doesn't really make sense for builders to buy, to build smaller homes. So the new stock that's because of lumber, uh, prices in the past, there was a lot of regulatory things that made it made no sense for, for builders to build, you know, 200, $250,000 houses, um, so, you know, I, I wonder how the, all of that is going to, is going to play out in the years to come with affordability and first time home buyers and, 
and all that. So uh, any thoughts on, on what could lie ahead there? No, you know, I've, I've had several economists, you know, local to Georgia, but advise on a national level say that um, the inventory problem won't be solved in their lifetime. So, um, you know, I, th I think we're going to have a seller's market and a robust housing market. And I really think that housing will be the shining light in, you know, any, any downturn or you know, negative news or, you know, will be the reason for the comeback. So it's nice to be in that position and also to be uh, essential, right? Yeah. And if you look at like these, these housing stats, like new built homes are flying off the market. People are flocking to bigger homes in the suburbs. It feels like the pandemic, the employment disruption part of the pandemic has not as much impacted, you know, the second home buyer, the third home buyer, the, you know, medium to large size home buyer, but the younger generation, millennials, that first time home buyer generation. And I just, I wonder, and I worry a little bit about what all this will do for just home ownership rates in the future years, you know, um, especially for people under the age of 30, uh, you know, could it lead to, uh, you know, very low home ownership rates for, for, for millennials and uh, people under 30 and, and more of a flock to renting uh, for those groups of people? Right. Well, I really think the GSEs, you know, are really going to have to put their heads together and come up with affordable programs. Um, you know, I've, I've often scratched my head as to, as to why FHA doesn't have their own version of a down payment assistance program. You know, they, they've always criticized or required, you know, 5013Cs and that type of thing. And, um, you know, FHA sometimes sort of gets uh, adversely selected because they allow lower credit scores. And there are a lot of higher credit score first time home buyers and young up and comers that you know have great credit values and such, and um, you know if they if they just you know had like a higher credit score requirement for 100% financing, or um, you know interest only for a period of time, like you know one to two years or something like that, you know just to make it easier for people to ease into home ownership and the tax benefits that come along with home ownership, it just it, I think lenders, all of us really need to spend a lot of time with uh, you know FHA on on their affordable products you know as much as you can you know volunteer your time and input uh, they're always taking you know suggestions and uh, you know it's, it's going to have to happen because you know affordability is going to become a problem for a lot of people I could not agree more. And I know you're very active in the industry, different advisory panels and advocacy efforts. And I think what you just said is spot on. People right now are so happy, making lots of money. Uh, I just worry a little bit that, um, you know, mortgage lenders across America, uh, maybe not keeping their eye on some of these things that you were talking about that could negatively impact our industry and housing in America more broadly, you look at Fannie and Freddie potentially exiting conservatorship, depending on what happens with the election. You think about all these hidden taxes on people buying homes. If it's increases to guarantee fees or 50% delivery fees that you know, like right now, it's easy to just lop these things on. Oh, mortgage owners are making so much money. What's another 50 basis points, right? Well, that goes to the home buyer. And you talk about that first time home buyer that there's very little inventory not a lot of new stock coming on the market in that first time home buyer price range. And then you start to lop all these things on and uh, you talk about maybe Fannie and Freddie coming out of conservatorship or staying in it and not offering good low to mod programs. And uh, it could, could, could have some negative impact in the future. So. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> so, um, uh, getting to what we were just talking about earlier, uh, some of the things you've done in the industry. Uh, one of the one of the things I know you're involved with is uh, Ellie May. Uh, I know you're on their advisory council. 
you know, certainly a topic of interest. I want to say just about half of our 206 lender members nationally are on Encompass. Um, you know, they were recently acquired again. Um, so uh, by ICE, the organization that bought MERS some years ago. So was wondering if there was any insight you could shed for our members, um, you know, just anything that you've been privy to being on that advisory council, maybe some of the things that are, are coming down the road uh, with Ellie. Right. Well, absolutely. So, you know, ICE um, was the first to computerize and digitize the, um, the petroleum exchanges, the New York Stock Exchange, uh, London, Singapore. And, you know, they did a phenomenal job with that and it's proven that it can work. And so, you know, in 2016, they acquired MERS um, through the ICE mortgage platform which is you know, one of their divisions. And in 2019, they bought Simplifile, which is the uh, electronic recordation of um, mortgage deeds and such. And this year um, in the pandemic, you know, during the pandemic and the pretty much shelter in place, um, Ben Jackson and, and Jeff Spreacher, or I think I'm saying that correctly, you know, came together and acquired Ellie Mae with the thought that, you know, it's pretty ridiculous what you have to go through to get a mortgage these days. And, you know, they really want to um, automate and digitize the entire process. They, you know, they were quoted in Fortune magazine of saying, you know, that today it costs $8,000 roughly to um, close a mortgage loan. And they think that with, you know, robotic process um, automation, artificial intelligence, you know, the complete automation of disclosures and, um, you know, the leveraging their AI platform, which actually Toma Bravo purchased Capsalon for Ellie May. And so now Capsalon is built in and they call it Ellie May AIQ. And they're, they're releasing that in, in different buckets, which I'll talk about in just a minute. But, um, you know, just, just automating disclosures they swear, you know, they've been cited as saying uh, that it produces an average cost savings of 63% for lenders. And, um, you know, everything from initial disclosures, lock desk, you know, loan setup, appraisal, verification, uh, ordering, um, verifying, also known as, you know, the drive reports, you know, being able to uh, leverage artificial intelligence and robotic process automation to read documents and, you know, you know, see the conditions move over to an underwriting sheet, you know, basically, and um, they're, they're moving their platform to um, a more vertical, less horizontal platform where you can have multiple personas working within a milestone um, and being very task oriented rather than um, sort of journey oriented where, you know, the processor completes 9,000 tasks you know, there's various personas that, that can complete those tasks, including the robotic process automation. Um, you know, they first released uh, Credit Analyzer, and, you know, that basically artificial, the artificial intelligence piece, you know, reads the credit documents and um, cross-references various things in the, in the file and, and will create underwriting conditions, you know, in the event that there's a, you know, bankruptcy or, you know, something in the past, it can actually read the documents and such. And they're, you know, moving to the next release will be income analyzer. Um, you know, so if you, if you just think about the, the four bucket or pails, we call it uh, property, assets, income, and liabilities, that's, that's how um, each of each segment of the artificial intelligence will be released to LMA users. And um, they are putting a large amount of money toward an e-closing platform. And they're gonna, they're gonna be called e-closing rooms. And you know, there, are, there are hurdles for some states like ours, you know, where you can't um, have electronic uh, remote not um, notarization and such because of state laws and, and things. But, you know, I'm, I'm confident that they'll take it to Washington and, and make it to where all, you know, across all states. Um, 
that you will be able to have a full e-closing platform. And they're also investing money in their um, EPPE platform, which is their pro uh, EPPS product and pricing system. And, um, you know, they were, they sort of, I think, lost out on the bid with, opt you know, on Optimal Blue to Black Knight. So um, there's, there's a huge push and a financial investment on improving their um, product and pricing engine platform. What a lot of people don't realize is that actually Ellie Mae has more EPPS users than OB users on their platform. So um, there's, there's a huge investment of time and money being spent on the um, pricing engine and artificial intelligence, RPA, automation, and um, the e-closing platform. That's a great insight. And that's, I guess, and I think about it, maybe not surprising, but you just, you think of OB as like just the dominant, you know, in that PPE space, but Encompass has so many clients that the ones that are using EPPS, I mean, I, I've never, nobody's ever said that to me before and it surprised me at first. And I thought about it, that they have more users than, than OB, but. Uh, I was surprised too. Two questions I want to ask you as a follow-up to all that excellent insight. One is kind of Ellie related. One is kind of, but not really. Um, the first would be just, you know, you look at the different estimates on uh, Encompass market share uh, in the mortgage marketplace, somewhere between 50 and probably 65%, um, depending on how you measure it. Um, your thoughts on like, is that healthy? You know, I know we have a lot of members that, you know, what we hear is like when they come up for their price renewals, they, you know, it's like negotiating with the mafia, you know, there's no, <laughs> there's uh, there's no negotiation. Is that healthy? You know, I mean, monopolies um, in business in America, there's, you know, protection around those being formed for, for those reasons. Um, so that's the first thing I'd love to get your thoughts on. The second would be just in general, like mortgage lenders are hiring operations personnel like there's no tomorrow i mean i have like three to four times a day recruiters that reach out to me um representing groups of underwriters operations personnel yet the emerging technology that you've mentioned a couple times now in our conversation um ai uh document recognition um this is obviously moving our industry towards less human beings involved in the mortgage manufacturing process. So you have mortgage lenders just, you know, gobbling up human staff right now. Behind the scenes, while we're all too busy to focus on it, the emerging technology is emerging. Um, is there possibly, you know, a day that's coming in the next year or two where you could see a lot of job loss in the mortgage industry because of that dynamic? So, uh, First thoughts on Ellie Mae market share, that health for the mortgage market in general, and then two, that dynamic of emerging technology versus adding humans right now. Okay, well, that's a lot. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the Ellie Mae and the monopoly. They do uh, represent, maybe if you take out the two big, you know, big banks and um, some of those with proprietary systems and such, you know, they they pretty much have you know, greater than 75% of the, the market. And, you know, one thing that they really do well, I think, is that, you know, they share their open architecture with other platforms, including POS systems like Simple Nexus and, um, you know, other e-closing platforms and e-notary platforms. And, uh, you know, there's a revenue share between, you know, all of these companies. So, I mean, I think that there, there will always be, um, you know, the ability to sort of um, tag on or, or interface, e even if it's totally um, not tra transparent, I guess, to the user, you know, in the user experience. So I think, I think the market has that pretty much covered because there's, you know, different things being offered and, um, new process automations, you know, new vendors coming into the place, into the space all the time that I don't think Monopoly, you know, is gonna be a huge problem. And there are a lot of um, new LOS systems coming out and with a lot of promising uh, features and such. So I think, I mean, it might cause, you know, Ellie Mae, you know, 
and others empower, you know, to really step up their game. Um, so, I mean, I, I think competition is good and you know, that there shouldn't be a, a, a total monopoly on LOS, but um, I, I think there's enough competition out there to prevent that from happening. And then as far as, you know, the employees, um, employee and leveraging technology and headcount and that type of thing, you know, what, what, you, what you hope happens is that, you know, you're leveraging technology to improve your processes and increase productivity so that you can do more business with the same amount of people rather than less people. So, I mean, that's certainly our goal at Bank South. And um, one of the things that, you know, we felt like we had to do, I guess now it's been maybe four years ago, um, you know, our heads were spinning around with all of the projects that had to, you know, come together and that type of thing. And someone had shared a book with me. Um, it's called The Three Box Solution. And I read the book and, you know, at, at first it was difficult for me to, you know, say, well, how does this really apply to the mortgage industry? Because we're not creating widgets, you know, where, you know, or a car down an assembly line and that type of thing. But anyway, the more I read into it, it, it really is about, um, improving your processes and keeping a loan moving forward rather than having it go forward and backwards and forward and backwards and you know that type of thing. So um, the three box solution is basically uh, built on the premise of um, you should you should break up your uh, teams basically into a box one, box two and box three, box one being managing the present. So you have your tech teams and your operational managers and such living sort of in box one improving the business today. So you're managing the present and box two would be, um, you know, while you're managing the present, you're also forgetting the past, meaning you're, you're letting go of old um, processes that really bog down the organization and keep things from moving forward all the time. You know, they're still moving backwards and forwards between underwriting and processing and so on and so on. But, um, so, you know, that's uh, forgetting the past selectively, you know, staying true to who you are from a customer service perspective, but what can we eliminate or stop doing or, or maybe even think, rethink, you know, the role of the process or the role of the setup person or the role, you know, of an underwriter. And um, so we spend a lot of time in, in both of those boxes. And then box three would be, you know, made up of dreamers and the executive team. And, um, you know, our, our first box three initiative was our uh, mobile app, you know, which is much like rocket mortgage and can, you know, a borrower can apply online on their phone. They can, you know, upload all of their documents and, um, you know, they're, uh, they basically do everything and pretty, and we even disclose through our mobile app today. But so box three is really about creating the future, you know, and you and thinking five years out, 10 years out, and it's, it's a sort of a danger free zone, you know, you can just throw out any idea kind of thing. And um, it, it has really, you know, changed our organization. And, you know, throughout this year alone, you know, where our productivity is, is off the chain, you know, because our employees are carrying loads that they've never carried before. And a lot of a lot of the reason why they can do that is because of the technology and investments that we've made over the last four years and continue to make. We actually just went through a big, um, um, I don't want to call it a reorganization, but we've looked at our tech teams and, and said, what are we missing? And we think going forward that we really need to have a technology person that specializes in workflow process management and um, so, you know, we're, we are about to make that higher. And then, um, you know, also to have people who can, that can just live in, in box one, which is, you know, fixing this thing or creating a new field and encompass or a new trigger or an alert or whatever, you know, to free up our developers, which, you know, we have two developers on staff um, to work on the bigger things, which, you know, would be, the artificial intelligence, the robotic process automation, the e-closing platform, um, you know, so that, so that we are, you know, ahead of the game. So, um, you know, I, I really do think that, 
you know, if you're always working on your business and not in your business, you're doing your employees um, a service. You know, it's, it's, it means that we're sustainable long term and that, you know, if job security is even more um, reassuring, I guess, because if you are, if, if you're working for someone who's not investing in robotic process automation and such, you know, that, and, you know, having a mobile app and the ease in doing business and online and that type of thing, you know, you may not have a job anyway. <laughs> so, you know, we, we actually are, spending money and, and adding resources to our technology team um, in a big way. And, you know, we just want to be able to do more loans, you know, with safety and soundness in mind, compliant, and, um, you know, with the same amount of people rather than less people. That's awesome. And you, we had a question come in, but you just answered it in your last response there. It was uh, from, I think, our mutual friend, Lori Brewer, in uh, not far from you in Macon, Georgia there. That's she, right. Yeah, showing some Georgia love. And uh, yeah, she asked a question about just, you know, prioritizing automation. You just actually perfectly answered it. So uh, we're about out of time. One last question. You a Braves fan? I am. No, not far from the Braves Stadium here. I'm going to say, right, tomorrow night they get going, right, against the Reds in the playoffs and your Falcons. What's going on with them? They can't hold oh a lead. Oh, my gosh. How about that lead? And <laughs> I mean, they, they're always way ahead and they end up losing. Not sure, really sure what's going on there. I think they might be resting on their laurels at some point during the game. I had to throw that jab and sports is on my mind. My beloved uh, Cleveland Indians get going here in four and a half hours against the Yankees in game one. So, uh, but Kim, we're out of time, but this was outstanding. Thank you so much for coming on, um, sharing your insight on so many pertinent topics with us. And don't be surprised if uh, you get the call back for another co-host slot for this thing. All right. Well, I would love to. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Thank you, Kim. And to everybody that took some time out, really appreciate you taking some time out. Not lost on us how busy things are. Same time, same place next week, 2 p.m. Eastern, last week in Mortgage Today. Until then, have a great day, everyone. Take care. Perfect.